Thank you very much, Amy and Simon. Thanks to the organising committee for inviting me to speak. Uh, this is, to me, the ultimate walk on the wild side, getting a neonatal, paediatric and adult intensivist in the same room trying to cover the same subject, so it'll be interesting to see how it all pans out. I don't have a slide that says it, but I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. So, getting right into this very interesting topic, um, I'm going to try to impart some general concepts of recruitment, uh, and then in the last part of my talk, just give you a flavour of how we think about recruitment in the newborn lung, thinking about that interesting process of aerating the gasless lung at the beginning of life, about the diffuse alveolar diseases we deal with, and about the fact of the newborn lung being especially vulnerable. So some of the concepts of recruitment bear thinking about carefully and hopefully will apply across the talks uh, that you're going to hear. So if we think of recruitment as the process of applying transpulmonary pressure to open the air spaces, although you have to acknowledge it's what you do afterwards that also is equally important. I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about the concepts of alveolar opening and closing pressures, about superimposed pressure, about the time dependence of opening and closing, which we'll see in the segue from this concepts uh, uh, section to that of the newborn lung, and talk a little bit about the potential benefits of recruitment. People have been interested in the volume response to pressure in the lung for many years. Here's some, an example of a panel from a paper by Salazar and Knowles, uh, published in 1964 from Harvard, and they got volunteers to inhale, measured their lung volume and the negative pressure they were generating. And for each sub subject, we're able to draw a graph like this, which shows the um, trajectory of lung volume as pressure is applied, in this case, by negative pressure. So transpulmonary pressure applied, and a exponential relationship, as one would imagine, leading ultimately to an asymptote at the maximum volume. And they were able to show that the volume at any given point could be related to the maximum volume, to the applied pressure at that particular point, and to this constant called the half inflation pressure, which was in essence the pressure at which the lung had reached half its ultimate volume. And people started to think maybe this sort of, of consideration could be applied within the micro-architecture of the lung. So let's now think about a lung composed of many millions of alveoli, many, many units, which may have a behaviour that could be similar to that described for the whole lung by Salazar and Knowles. And so there's this idea that's been used in a number of modelling papers, and uh, some of which I'm going to tell you about, that that maybe the micro mechanics of the lung are same as the macro mechanics and the same exponential equation of Salazar and Knowles could apply to alveolar volume of each and every lung unit as we apply pressure. But I think we all know that it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, and whilst this sort of uh, approach might apply to the healthy lung, where all the lung units have the capacity to open easily, we know that for a diseased lung there are other and, and more important things that we have to consider. Uh, and I'm just going to show you a video that uh, a, um, a team from Buffalo headed by Gary Neiman has, uh, have used for examining the behaviour of lung units and they use a technique called confocal microscopy where they apply a microscope to the pleural surface. And very interestingly, uh, when they first started doing this, they were able to see that many of the alveoli were filled with fluid, but yet others were actually completely collapsed. Uh, and it was only upon lung expansion that these units started to show signs of opening up. Uh, and in the video here that hopefully will play for us, you'll see what happens as these units open and then close. And in this video, time cycled pressure limited uh, ventilation is being applied to this diseased animal lung uh, and zero PEEP is being applied. Hopefully we can get this to play. Hmm. Oops. I'm not going to get that to play. Well, I'm going to tell you what it shows and I'm hoping my next two videos play. Um, so what we, uh, and if anyone up in the back there can get it to play, that would be terrific. Uh, what, I'm expect, what, what we see in this video is that these, many of these lung units, and you can see them 
uh, some of the lung units here outlined in the, in the confocal microscopy, many of them are actually completely collapsed at zero PEEP at the end of expiration. And during the process of the next inspiration, they open up and then as the inspiration finishes and expiration begins, they close. And each unit appears to open and then close at maybe a slightly different pressure or as I'll tell you later, maybe a slightly different time. So from that, one can draw the conclusion that maybe the micromechanics of a, of a diseased lung unit are altered by virtue of there being an identifiable alveolar opening pressure, which is the pressure at which the alveolus opens from a volume of zero to a volume that's then determined by this Salazar-Knowles relationship. And we're taking that one step further, there would be an identifiable closing pressure which is uh, the point at which the volume having gone down as we go down in pressure suddenly drops to zero as this unit actually closes and loses all its volume. Well, they're theoretical considerations, but actually there's some experimental data in human subjects that suggests these, these opening and closing pressures for lung units may really exist. And I was fascinated uh, more than 10 years ago listening to Luciano Gattinoni presenting his work uh, where he's examined, uh, exhaustively examined CT uh, images of, of human subjects uh, and experimental animals with ARDS. Uh, and uh, I was very interested to hear how when he did those experiments first back in the early 90s, he actually bribed the radiographers in the CT suite to allow him to take the ventilated subjects to get this uh, information for research purposes. Uh, and here's an example of one of uh, the studies from that group. Uh, in this case, trying to, to determine whether the opening and closing pressures could be mapped for a small group of, of uh, human subjects, adult human subjects, around five or six patients with ARDS. And what they were able to show was that both for opening and closing pressures, they were able to see a normal distribution of opening and closing pressures. Uh, and you can see there that the midpoint for opening and closing is quite different. And if you can imagine a, hu a cumulative histogram based on, on this uh, distribution, you can see that by the time the airway pressure reaches 30 centimetres of water, most, but not all, of the units would be open. And there are some units here that wouldn't even open be, you know, until 40 or even 50 centimetres of water. Similarly, as we're coming down in pressure, spending time in expiration, uh, by the time we get down here below about 5 centimetres of water, many of the units, probably around about half, would be closed suggesting that a PEEP of five would be insufficient in this case. So these opening and closing pressures of lung units probably do exist and maybe have a normal distribution. Then there's another concept that Gattinoni uh, espoused and, and really pursued uh, along with, in this case, with Paolo Pelosi uh, in this earlier publication from their group. And this essentially says that if you have a normal lung, the, the gravitational pressures uh, imposed in lying in a supine position will not be that great and, and they'll, mo most of the units in the top part of the lung will, be, will have gas in them rather than be tissue or water uh, and as we go down you can see the, the gradient there of gas and tissue. Whereas if we take a diseased lung there'll be more tissue or water in, in all uh, gradients here in this arbitrary scale from 1 to 10 and so essentially that means the lung at the top is going to be weighing down on the lung at the bottom. And that's the concept of superimposed pressure. And if we take a, a dependent subject, in this case a, a baby, uh, we could uh, make a gradient uh, of, um, uh, fr from front to back from in the cephalocaudal axis here, and, and here in this case we have nine centimetres of water. And that might mean that these units at the back of the lung have nine centimetres of water of superimposed pressure on them, which, as I'm going to tell you, means that they might need nine extra centimetres of water of pressure to get them open. Unfortunately, we can't talk about recruitment without mentioning these papers by Keith Hickling. And the second one of these is the one that I would recommend to you to read, uh, published in 2001, and the modelling that I'm going to show you is based on this paper which is more refined and well-developed than the first. I would also recommend to have a, a nice big glass of Tasmanian Pinot Noir when you dive into reading these papers. <laughs> 
What Keith Hickling essentially did was to take these concepts of the potential for, of the um, mechanics, the micro mechanics of the, of the lung to reflect the behaviour of a whole lot of individual lung units in the same way as the macro mechanics. He then took the concepts of the lung opening and closing pressures, added a superimposed pressure, and also added some ventilator pressures, and came up with uh, and, and applied these rules of engagement to the process. He said that let's take a lung which has maybe a thousand units. That, and he said that the transalveolar pressure for each lung unit was equal to the applied pressure at the airway opening minus the superimposed pressure, as we've said. He then said if a unit's closed, the transalveolar pressure had to exceed the opening pressure for that unit to open. Once the unit was open, the volume that the lung unit would assume was the volume as determined by the Salazar-Knowles relationship. Uh, and once a unit was open, uh, a, a lung unit would open, only close if the transalveolar pressure dropped below the closing pressure uh, of that lung unit during deflation. He, in his papers, showed a series of static images, which are, I would have to say, quite difficult to interpret and to understand. And that led me and, uh, and, uh, and my group to try to um, show these images as a series of, of dynamic representations rather than as static images. And I'm hoping that we'll have a video that we'll play for you here. And what we did was to make a, a, um, a lung, uh, lung modelling simulation where we used exactly the same concepts as in the Hickling paper, in fact recreated those concepts and added ventilator pressures and were able in a, in a dynamic sense to be able to show the concepts of recruitment. And I'm going to show you a video, I hope, that uh, will show what happens as we apply a, a time cycle pressure li limited ventilation with increasing steps of positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP. So a PEEP steps manoeuvre and we'll see what happens as that, as that plays out. And hopefully we can get it to go. Super. So we've got here the panel showing the pressure volume relationship down here on the right, and we've got a lung that's uh, showing the tidal ventilation that's occurring. We've got the compliance here indicated. And we've gone up now to the midpoint of the inflation limb of the pressure volume relationship. And what you're seeing there is the number of lung units gradually opening, gradually increasing. So during that time, during the inflation series, recruitment happened throughout the inflation limb. Now we're at total lung capacity. We've got recruitment. We wouldn't possibly want to stay at this, at this high lung volume. And now we're doing peep steps down. And with that, we're seeing the lung compliance increase very significantly and we're seeing uh, good lung inflation right down to the lower end of the PEEP steps manoeuvre. Given the time available, we've had to go through that very quickly. Oops. What are the physiological benefits of recruitment? Emphasising that PEEP optimisation has to follow. And for this, we can look at Luckman's original description of opening up the lung and keeping up keeping the lung open. And what he described was that there should be tidal ventilation with minimum pressure amplitude. And you saw on the deflation limb after lung recruitment that compliance was optimised um, on the deflation limb during tidal ventilation. There should be better gas exchange. There should be reduction of shear stress and lung injury. And although Lockman didn't say it, there should be more homogeneous distribution of ventilation. Just going to show you a study that I was fortunate to be involved with with Peter Rimmensberger and Ines Frerichs. We did this work in Geneva. And we used electrical impedance tomography, which shows um, a map of the aeration of the lung, like a, a CT scan at the bedside, if you like. And you can see here a cross-sectional representation of the different colours representing different aeration of these different regions of the lung. And you can divide the lung, as we, as we do, into right and left, and also into ventral, medial, and dorsal thirds. And what we did was a peep steps manoeuvre in uh, ventilated piglets who had been lavaged to create a model of surfactant depletion and, and uh, edema. And you can see this peep steps manoeuvre where we held the delta pressure, the difference between pip and peep, at a constant 10 centimetres of water, and we did peep steps of 5 centimetres of water up to 25 and then back down to zero. Uh, 
And we could map uh, the changes in lung volume that occurred globally and also in the different regions that I showed uh, in the impedance map. And you can see here what happens in the right ventral region of the lung in terms of the change in lung volume expressed as a relative change in impedance. And from it, you can ultimately derive a pressure volume relationship and you can see that we started out with a, a relatively gasless lung by virtue of disconnecting the animal before starting the peep steps manoeuvre and ultimately we reached a point close to total lung capacity. So this is a vital capacity manoeuvre. And we would expect and hope that at this point our lung had been well recruited. And what we did for the analysis was to take the final tidal breath at each of the peep steps uh, to give us an idea. And you can see there's some time dependence here, whereby there's, there's three breaths here at 10, 10 centimetres of water peep with this one culminating in this breath here. So there's a fair bit of time dependence of this model, which is very important in our considerations of recruitment. Interestingly, when we plot the global tidal volume during these peep steps up to total lung capacity and then going down again, we see something very interesting. And that is, this is the delta pressure is the same throughout, but the tidal volume isn't. And here, in this graph, the tidal volume is, is expressed as a percentage of the maximum. And you can see, just as Souter found in his seminal observation in, in New England Journal in 1975, it's after full recruitment on the deflation limb that one can use tidal breath compliance to identify what might be a point of optimal ventilation. And you can see here as we get down to a P of 5 in this particular example, we get optimal tidal volume, the best compliance for our given applied pressure. We've gone one step further and, and said what could we know regionally in the lung. And we've again looked at the uh, tidal volumes here expressed as a percentage of the regional maximum in the right and left side, ventral, medial and dorsal regions in different shades of grey. And as we start out with a pretty degassed lung, we can see that while the ventral region is, has a tidal volume pretty close to its maximum, down here in the dorsal region where there's more superimposed pressure, there's very little tidal volume in that area. This particular loop does not reflect, therefore, what's going on regionally in this lung. And as we walk up the inflation limb of the pressure volume relationship, we see recruitment because as we're applying more pressure, we're getting more tidal volume in a particular region. So that has to be an indication of more aeration, more, more lung units involved in the process. And as we march up towards total lung capacity, not surprisingly, the lung becomes over distended and all regions lose their tidal volume. And then as we go down the deflation limb, this is where the money is because we're finding now that we can identify a point where the tidal ventilation in each of the regions is homogeneous and it happens to be at a peep of five centimetres of water. If we go below that level we find again inhomogeneity of ventilation. So we think it is possible that we could use electrical impedance tomography at the bedside to identify a point where ventilation to regions of the lung is the most homogeneous and that may be a useful way of refining the recruitment and lung volume optimization process. Now I want to spend the last minutes just talking about recruitment in the newborn lung. It's interesting that we don't really think of it as such but recruitment is the most important element of getting a baby breathing after birth because they start off at birth, every baby born at full term and otherwise healthy, with a fluid filled and gasless lung. Tony Milner, way back uh, nearly 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, looked at the um, volume pressure relationship in the newborn uh, baby at the first breath of life. And here, if we start here, we can see initially there is positive pressure uh, at the airway opening with the baby crying, and then this enormous negative gasp, uh, gasp in by the baby, during which time lung volume increases significantly. Note the pressure achieved by the baby, minus 70 centimetres of water, and then the baby cries. Ultimately, the remaining lung volume is an increment from the zero that the baby started out with, and as the breaths then come one on top of the other, functional residual capacity is established. But the transpulmonary pressure here of minus 70 is the thing that I always find the most interesting. So that's the healthy term lung. What about the pathological state of being born premature? 
Uh, and here I'm going to show you my, my last video. Hopefully it'll play for us. And this one is a video that's obtained in preterm uh, rabbits using the approach of phase contrast imaging, uh, which one does by um, uh, having the rabbits in a, a, um, a, unit, a synchrotron unit with a beam of electrons being, being fired at them. And you can get beautiful phase contrast images of the lung during this critical time of inflation. And this uh, rabbit is having time cycled pressure limited ventilation applied to it at a constant pressure. And what I'm hoping we can show is yeah, these certainly played for me when I first uh, looked at them. Hmm, I'm going to have to describe it again. Um, what we see here is that as the pressure is applied to this lung, not all of the change in lung volume that ultimately occurs, occurs at one time. So there's an increment a gradual increment to the point where these uh, lung units become fully recruited. This is the time dependence of recruitment behaviour in the lung and it's very important. So we shouldn't think of recruitment as just being a pressure phenomenon, it's a pressure times time phenomenon. Uh, and if you apply a, sh a good pressure for a very short time, you will not be able to achieve lung recruitment. Second thing to stay, say about the newborn lung is that diffuse alveolar disease is very common in the newborn, much more common than I believe it is in, at any other time, and responds well to recruitment. Here are a couple of examples. So I think you can agree that all of these lungs are pretty gasless and could do with some recruitment. Uh, respiratory distress syndrome is obviously the, the, the critical disease that we deal with in the premature newborn but you can also agree that this baby who suffered from a pulmonary hemorrhage uh, has a fairly gasless lung. In both of these cases, you would expect an excellent resp response to recruitment, and clearly that would be what's necessary in these two babies who are both going to be poorly oxygenated. Babies who have pulmonary hypoplasia, for whatever reason, can have a pretty gasless lung, and so can those who have meconium aspiration syndrome. However, in these cases, the response to recruitment may be uh, less predictable uh, and may be compromised in, in the case of hypoplasia by vulnerability to stretch injury and in the case of meconium aspiration uh, by coexistence of hyperinflation. I've been privileged to have David Tingo as a PhD student. Some of you will know him. He did work at the Royal Children's in Melbourne where we actually, for the first time, were able to map the pressure volume relationship in um, term, a, a group of mainly term uh, newborn infants who are on high frequency ventilation. And able to show the value of recruitment in those babies by, by seeing the difference between the volume achieved uh, from the initial starting pressure at which the clinicians were providing oscillation after recruitment to what we call Pmax, we were able to see then that our volume was so much higher on the deflation limit of the pressure volume relationship right down to this point of closing pressure or P final. Oxygenation also improved during that process. Here the, the filled dots are the oxygenation on the deflation limb. Although you can see the oxygenation was actually fairly consistent over a wide spread of pressures on the deflation limb. We think it's probably better to identify a point down here just above closing pressure to provide oscillation and have more recently published a paper showing that lung mechanics and even CO2 can guide us in that approach. It is the case, even though the anteroposterior diameter of the newborn lung, uh, the anteroposterior diameter of the newborn lung is relatively shallow compared to an adult, that there's dependent atelectasis that we need to deal with in these infants. Here's, here are two examples. Firstly, the very diffuse uniform disease of surfactant protein B deficiency uh, with a uniform opacity on, on plain X-ray, but you can see some dependent atelectasis and, and a difference uh, in the um, lung unit behaviour related to the dependent areas of the lung. Even in a preterm newborn, we see this. Here's an MRI of a, of a term newborn having a brief anaesthetic with good lung inflation. Here's the MRI of a preterm infant showing these areas at the back of the lung which are uh, waterlogged, uh, presumably related to superimposed pressure. Finally, 
whilst we'd like to think we'd want to use recruitment in um, newborn infants, it has to be balanced against the risk of causing damage. Uh, and newborns have very vulnerable lungs. Uh, it's possible to really terribly over distend the lungs of a newborn infant. The chest wall is not uh, uh, as heavily calcified as an adult and therefore there's the potential to do awful damage and have awful stretch. And of course this is an x-ray from someone else's unit than mine. Even, uh, even the fact of being born very prematurely, here a, a baby at 24 weeks, which is about our gestational age limit, uh, nicely inflated lungs, in fact you could argue perhaps even a bit overinflated with relatively flat diaphragms and a narrow cardiac waist. This baby's on CPAP at this stage uh, and just by applying perhaps a little bit too much pressure by day 15 we have this horrible situation of a lung that's really been terribly damaged and now there's cystic pulmonary interstitial emphysema. So my conclusions are that it is possible first of all to meaningfully model the pressure volume behaviour of the lung that recruitment can only be effective if it's followed by lung volume optimization. That this approach definitely has a place in the, in the diffuse alveolar disease of the newborn, but that because of the heightened risk of lung injury, we need to keep in mind the possibility that our recruitment maneuvers might cause, cause damage. I'd like to acknowledge these individuals and groups for their help in preparing this talk and the work that's been done uh, on the, uh, leading up to it. Uh, and I'd like to urge you if you do want to take a walk on the wild side, this is not a bad place to go uh, to do it, except it takes three days to walk in to get there. Thank you.